Let's sing, O oh, my soul. with a mic. How's that? Is that better? Let's start over. Good morning. Oh, now everybody's awake, so it was me. All right. Uh, the church would like to extend their thanks for the Botox Association Church Patient Class
we hear the message, we would listen, learn, be encouraged by it. Maybe some changes we could make in our lives as that's come forward. Pray for uh, Frank and Mary, Patty, Curtis, and the rest of the family as Frank has been placed in hospice care, that you would pr provide comfort and peace. Uh, it's never, never a fun time to be with a family member in hospice care. Father, I ask that you would just wrap your loving arms around that family. Be with Steve as he prepares to go in for hip replacement surgery Tuesday. Uh, give him the peace and the comfort and understanding that he is in your hands and that the doctors will be guided by you and your will. I pray that you would be with Jerry this morning as he brings the message. In Jesus' holy and heavenly name, amen. I tried to sound as good as you can. Sorry. I sabotaged you. I forgot and left the mic on. Psalm 29, verses 1 through 4. 
Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of thunder, the God of glory, thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. Thank you. 
Thanks. Why don't you give them a hand, man? They do this Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. So we're going to do a test, Linda? Okay. We didn't have a chance to do that earlier. So let me know when to click. Now? Okay. I should be good? Yeah. Woohoo! Have you ever stopped to consider? Hey, Steve. Tomorrow's the big day? Tuesday. Oh, yeah. Have you ever stopped to consider the powerful images that are found in the Bible? You know, I don't know if you recall, but we looked at a number of these images from January through April as we worked through the parables in Matthew chapter 13. So we looked at the images of seeds and wheat and field, a sower, yeast, treasures, pearls, so on. Visuals are powerful, powerful. I remember watching the news uh, as they were reporting on the evacuation of troops and civilians from Afghanistan. And I remember seeing a large military cargo plane taxiing down a runway, preparing to, to take off. And I'm, I'll never forget just the tons, the throngs of individuals that are holding on to any part of that plane that they can possibly hold on to, kind of reminding me like ants on a piece of candy. Did you catch what I just did? I used verbal imagery, ants on a piece of sugary candy, to describe all these people hanging on to the wheels of an aircraft. You know, the Holy Spirit used a variety of human authors to uh, record imagery in their writings to better help us understand what is being said or what is being revealed, because imagery is a really very... It's a powerful tool, and I find it especially valuable when it comes to understanding a group of individuals that had emerged during Jesus' earthly ministry, a group of individuals that continued to grow in number and influence after Jesus left the earthly scene following his resurrection. And obviously, who am I talking about? I'm talking about the church, a group of people that have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ both past and present. And I want to examine some of the imagery that's used in the New Testament to better, better help us understand how we fit into God's divine plan. You see, sometimes when church is mentioned, we tend to focus on a building, don't we? A physical structure. You know, and that becomes very evident even in some of the things that we say, like, what are you doing on Sunday morning? Well, I'm going to church. What does that mean? Well, in this case, you decided to come to a physical location, 1635 76th Street here in South Haven. In fact, this building has a name. We call it First Baptist Church. I mean, that's what the sign says, right, when you pull in. The New Testament never refers to the church in this manner. Never, never. The New Testament always uses the word church to describe a group of people, God's people. And so imagery can help us understand who we are and what God's desire is for us in these upcoming weeks because it's important for us as God's people to know how we fit into his divine plan for mankind. As you can see from the title of this morning's message, we will be looking at the flock imagery. Flock imagery is one of the most powerful images in the Bible. You know, for years, this imagery was something that I was quite unfamiliar with. I didn't grow up in a rural area. I didn't grow up on a farm my dad did. I grew up in a little city called Chicago. And uh, my understanding of a flock was limited. I knew there was a band called Flock of Seagulls. 
I was familiar with the saying, birds of a feather flock together. I understand how flock can be used as a verb when a bunch of people are gathering together in a crowd. And while I knew it was used to describe a group of sheep or goats, no one that I ever grew up with had a flock of sheep or goats. They had dogs, they had cats, but no one had a flock of sheep. And so over the years, it intrigued me as to why Jesus referred to his people as a flock. On one occasion, Jesus was introducing his followers uh, to the importance of not worrying about what they were going to eat and what they were going to drink and what they were going to wear. And he said to them, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom, Luke 12, 32. And in this word, the flock has to do with the small group of individuals that were following Jesus. And it was Jesus who expands upon the meaning of this word, flock. He takes this word and he places it in the context of sheep and shepherds, an image that was very, very, very familiar to the people that were listening and were engaging with Jesus. A great example of this is found in John 10. Jesus had just healed a blind man, and the religious leaders did not like it very much because Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath. And so some, in frustration, some Pharisees accused Jesus of calling them blind. And Jesus then addresses the entire audience of individuals that had gathered there, including the religious leaders. And in verses 1 through 5, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. And then in the next verse, the Apostle John says this, he said, Jesus used this figure of speech, this imagery, but they did not understand what he was telling them. In verses 7 through 18, Jesus again uses this imagery of sheep and goats and shepherds, and he talks about the gate of the, the, gate of the sheepfold, right? And he says that he himself is the gate through which sheep are allowed access into the sheepfold. He refers to himself as the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for his sheep. And the shepherd knows his sheep. And the sheep know him. And then in the middle of this discussion, Jesus calls the sheep a flock. A flock. And the imagery illustrates how there is only one way, one gate that leads the sheep, into the sheepfold or leads into the kingdom of God. Or heaven. Sheep can only enter through him. They are his sheep. He is the good shepherd. He is the one and he alone who lays down his life for the flock. That's why the author of Hebrews says, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. Sheep and flock, one in the same, right? They're one in the same. They consist of all those individuals over time that have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and in his saving work on the cross. The flock, the sheep is a reference, my friends, to the church. To the church, past as well as present. You and I belong to the good shepherd. You and I belong to the great shepherd. The sheep flock shepherd imagery continued to describe the church even after Jesus ascended into heaven. 
And in Acts 20, verse 28, Paul instructs the elders at the church of Ephesus because he was about to leave them. And he says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Keep watch over the flock. They were to keep watch over themselves. They were to keep watch over the flock. This idea of keeping watch means to be on the alert. It means to take heed. The idea is to take care of someone. Yes, Paul says you need to take care of yourselves, but he also says you need to take care of all the flock. The word translated flock here comes from the same word group from which we get the word sheep. So the elders were to take care of themselves and they were to take care of the sheep of the good shepherd. Now notice also the phrase of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The Holy Spirit is the one who entrusts sheep to shepherds, under shepherds, individuals acting on behalf of the good shepherd or the great shepherd. They don't own the flock. Rather, they take care of the flock that's been entrusted to them. Also notice that the Holy Spirit is the one who made elders overseers. And this, this idea here of overseers is the same word that's found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, a passage of Scripture that we often use in regard to the responsibilities of a pastor. Shepherd, pastor, one and the same. Same kind of idea, same kind of concept. And so we see the terms elder and overseer and shepherds all referring to the same thing that you and I would normally call today a pastor. Sheep and flock both refer to the church whom Jesus purchased with his own blood. Now the Apostle Peter, one of the twelve that was with Jesus, uses the same kind of imagery when he addresses the elders to the church at large. And he writes, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers. Not because you must, but because you're willing. Because you're willing, again, the flock is God's flock, which means the church belongs to God. Now, even though Jesus' followers would have been very familiar with this imagery, I, I had to look a little bit deeper into this imagery because I didn't live 2,000 years ago. I didn't live on the other side of the world like those individuals in Jesus' day. In other words, for me, then, I have a kind of a hard time relating to this, this kind of imagery, shepherd, sheep, and stuff like that. I don't understand that. And so I looked and found out that sheep are relatively dumb animals. I mean, they're helpless creatures. I, I'm not meaning that in a derogatory way, but they're just... Hey, thanks, Rock. I'm going to put it in my back pocket because gremlins are gremlins, right? Where was I? Oh, yeah. Sheep are dumb. 
<laughs> they lack natural defenses, which makes them very vulnerable to predators. They lack the capacity on their own to seek out food and water for themselves, especially during difficult times and difficult environments. They tend to wander, which, again, isn't really good for animals who lack natural defenses, right? We have difficulty looking for food and looking for water. And I also came to realize, I don't know why I was surprised, that sheep bite at times. They just bite. Now what in the world does this imagery have to do with people? Well, you could say that all of humanity in its fallen state is relatively dumb and helpless. They don't have the capacity to seek after God. All of humanity does not necessarily acknowledge God as God. Does not seek after God's kingdom because it's only interested in itself. It lacks defenses against attacks of the enemy which, by the way, is in opposition to God and his kingdom. It lacks the capacity to hunger and to thirst for righteousness. And so mankind just wanders about through life, doing whatever is right in its own eyes. And then things change. Things change because Jesus came. And he provided a way into the sheepfold. And he calls his sheep, and his sheep hear his voice. And he leads the flock to food and to water, helping them hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he provides protection from the enemy. And when they bite, he disciplines them. Now, I have a picture hanging on my wall in my office that I've had probably ever since I entered into vocation ministry, and it's a picture of a shepherd carrying a sheep on his shoulders. It's a nice picture because the sun is just glistening through the trees onto the snowy ground. And on the picture, under the pictures of a verse, John 10, verse 11, which says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. What a romantic picture. Unfortunately, the imagery of a shepherd and his flock is not meant to be romantic. Our understanding of shepherds and sheep is far more romantic than what it was actually like in biblical times. I mean, we're so separated from that. Time and culture have separated us from a clear and experiential understanding of this imagery. But that doesn't mean that it's not relevant to us today. In biblical times, it was possible for shepherds to have owned their sheep, but oftentimes they would be watching the flock on behalf of someone else. And in this flock imagery, we see that Jesus is the owner as well as the good and the great shepherd. And this is probably the most important thing to remember about this imagery. And I know it's real easy for individuals sharing a message like this to go into great detail about each and everything that a shepherd does in his profession. It's easy to go into great detail about how sheep really act under a variety of circumstances, but I chose not to do that today because it can lead very easily to romantic observations. So instead, I want to focus on some of the details of this flock imagery and how they pertain to the church, especially the church in the day and age in which we live. 
As I just mentioned, um, Jesus owns this flock. It's true that he is the good shepherd. It's true that he is the great shepherd who keeps watch over his sheep. He's the owner. He has bought each one of us who are in the flock for a price. It's 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20 state, You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Now, in our individualistic world, this is important for us to remember. It's important. We're not a single organism that is separated from anyone and anything else. Our individualism is found in being a member of a flock, one flock. Many members, one flock. Individually, we are part of the flock. Individualism is not the end result. The second thing to note in regard to this imagery is that flock exists not for our benefit. The flock exists for the benefit of the owner. The owner does not exist for the benefit of the sheep. In biblical times, and even today, sheep are raised for the benefit of the owner, and they, they provide food, they provide milk, they're valued for their wool, the hair that they produce, sometimes that's turned into fabric, sometimes it's used to stuff pillows and other things like that. The flock exists for the owner, not the other way around. A third thing to note in regard to this imagery is that the owner made sure someone took care of the oversight of the sheep's care. And again, in this imagery, they are called what? Shepherds. As I mentioned, the owner of the sheep would often be the one who may have shepherded the flock, but such was not always the case. Nevertheless, because sheep have such a difficult time existing on their own, shepherds were given the responsibility to make sure that the flock is safe, to make sure that it's healthy, to make sure that it's reproducing. And that's why shepherds were given the responsibility to water and to feed and to protect and to gather and, and go out and find those sheep that were lost. It was their responsibility to provide security and provide rest, to mend injuries, to promote reproduction. Now, no one would argue that shepherds take care of sheep. What we fail to realize is that the shepherd didn't take care of the sheep for the sheep's benefit. Again, that's, that falls into the trap of having a romantic understanding. It distorts both the ownership and the purpose of the flock. Sheep exist for the owner. And so do the shepherds, for that matter. So here's where the difficulty lies. Somewhere over time, the significance of this imagery has flip-flopped. It's flip-flopped. Somewhere over time, the flock has come to believe that the shepherd exists for the sake of the flock. Somewhere over time, the flock has come to believe that the owner exists for the benefit of the flock. And I tell you, this didn't happen overnight. It's been a gradual distortion. Personally, I think that this is a result of the attacks of the enemy. Because the devil doesn't mind that there's a church as long as the church doesn't understand and carry out what she is supposed to do. For example, it's estimated that there's probably 11,000 different Protestant denominations today. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? This development didn't happen overnight. Again, this was something that developed over time, and, and there's a lot of different factors that contribute to the formation of denominations. 
And 11,000 different Protestant denominations are not necessarily bad. Because there's many kind of sheep in the flock, aren't there? Think back to the Old Testament of when Jacob was taking care of Laban's flock. I mean, there was a diversity there in the flock. Some of the sheep were speckled, some of the sheep were spotted, some were streaked, some were dark-colored animals. And even though there was diversity, they still made up one flock. I see this diversity within Christianity, don't you? Unfortunately, I also see a, a, a tremendous amount of individualism. I mean, some speckled sheep want absolutely nothing to do with spotted sheep. Some streaked sheep have nothing to do with dark-colored sheep. We use, we abuse, and we accuse one another in ways that do not foster unity. And all the while, the enemy sits back and smiles. I like this. Go church. Here's another example. The enemy has been highly successful in getting the flock to develop a distorted view of shepherds. I'm not referring to Jesus being the good or the great shepherd. I'm referring to those shepherds that the Holy Spirit chooses to oversee God's flock. Individuals like the Apostle Peter, individuals like Timothy, like the elders at Ephesus, like pastors in our local churches today. And rather than viewing these individuals as those who exercise oversight of the flock on behalf of the owner, many in the flock have come to view them as those who oversee the flock for the flock's benefit. In America, consumerism has contributed to this distortion. Consumerism has caused us to ask the question, what's in it for me? In the Old Testament, Jacob's sons were shepherds by trade. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine Reuben's flock choosing to move from Reuben to Asher's flock because Asher's flock was a little bit more attractive. Can you imagine sheep from Levi's flock telling Levi that they wanted to leave because, hey, I got to become a part of Simeon's flock. And can you imagine a flock asking the shepherd what they have to offer so that they can decide what flock they want to go to? Can you imagine some in Zebulun's flock telling him that they're moving to Judah's flock because his fields are filled with alfalfa rather than just grass? Oh, yeah, and because their fields are a little bit more shady. I know this is a touchy subject. It's a touchy subject, so I won't give you any more examples. Let me simply say that in my 30 years of pastoral experience, I have never had anybody come up to me and say, hey, pastor, we're just kind of new in the area. Here is my spiritual gifts. How can you use me? How can you use me for the kingdom? Typically, the questions are, so what do you got to offer? Do you remember that comic strip, Doonesbury? I mean, it hasn't been published, I think, for whenever. And so, I never forget this one. I, and you're probably not going to be able to read it. But anyway, the whole thing is, so here are these people in this, uh, coming to, to talk to a minister in a church, and the first thing there says, uh, uh, basically, I believe that we're all recovering sinners. My ministry is all about our becoming uh, overcoming denial. It's about recommitment, about redemption. It's all in the brochure there. And then this couple here in the frame to the right says, wait a minute, sinners, redemption, 
doesn't all that imply guilt? And the minister says, well, yes, I, I do really, I do rely on the uh, occasional uh, <laughs> disincentive to keep the flock from going astray. Guilt's part of that. A couple down here says, I don't know. There's, much neg- there's so much negativity in the world as it is. His wife says, well, that's right. We're looking for a church that's supportive of a place where we can feel good about ourselves. I am not sure this guilt thing works for us. And they say, on the other hand, you do offer racquetball. And his wife said, so do the Unitarians, honey. Let's shop around some more. Whose flock do we want to go to? Who's got the best deal? <laughs> Little did I know that how prophetic that comic would be one day. <laughs> yeah, sheep can distort things. Hey, so can shepherds. All right? They can distort this imagery when they forget that the flock that has been entrusted to them is not their flock. They didn't buy it. It's God's flock. They forget that they're not the owners. They are not the good shepherd. They're not the great shepherd. They can forget that they oversee the flock, not for their glory, but for the glory of God, for the owner. So they can distort things too, and when they do again, the enemy just loves that. Just loves when this occurs. That's why as your pastor, I take this imagery seriously. I take it seriously because I believe God has called and gifted me to shepherd God's flock here at First Baptist Church. You do not belong to me. I don't own you. And one day I'll have to give an account for how I've exercised my oversight responsibilities. Jesus used this imagery to help us understand our relationship to him, the church's relationship to him. We are his flock. We are one flock. We exist for his honor and for his glory. I hope you don't forget that today. I hope you understand the differences between owners and shepherds and sheep. May you always remember that the good shepherd is the one who laid down his life for you. And as such, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips that confess his name. We're going to spend some time in prayer. Please don't be uh, forgetful about keeping the Booker family in your prayers. Let's pray as the Spirit leads.
Let's stand together, flock, and give God the praise that he deserves by singing Our God Reigns before we're dismissed. God reigns. God bless you. You're dismissed. Go live out your faith.